This session, I'm going to talk about diagnosing heartworm disease slash infection in cats. Um, unlike in the dog, where it's a pretty straightforward diagnosis, I think everybody uh, that lives in an endemic area feels pretty comfortable. Yeah, I can establish a diagnosis. I can confirm that diagnosis in the dog. I feel pretty comfortable at the end of the day. Cats, um, um, cats are cats, right? Cats uh, wake up in the morning, say, how can I mess with a veterinarian today? They make diagnosis, treatment, management, long-term prevention challenging for us. Um, so when we talk about heartworm disease in the cat and diagnosing the disease, one of the things we have to do is go back to the life cycle and understand where we see symptomatic disease in the cat. We have to recognize that we see symptomatic disease at two stages, one in the pre-adult stage um, where they get primarily respiratory symptomatology, uh, oftentimes associated with what's referred to as heart or heartworm associated respiratory disease. And then of course they can be symptomatic when they have an adult infection. Um, definitively establishing those diagnoses can be challenging. And unlike in the dog where we have a routine where we feel comfortable, in cats you oftentimes have to, to stage that diagnosis. In cats oftentimes you have to recognize that diagnosing them in the early stage of the disease, the pre-adult stage, involves different diagnostics than establishing the diagnosis at the adult stage. So when you think about definitive diagnosis of heartworm disease in the cat, what are the diagnostic tests that you think about? Well, obviously a dye fill test, a uh, positive dye fill test is pretty compelling evidence that that cat has um, an adult heartworm infection, a patent adult heartworm infection. We'll talk about the challenges with that and the sort of the limitations in that as well. Uh, antigen testing. Antigen testing, obviously a positive antigen test um, is pretty definitive evidence that you have an adult infection. Limitations to it. Talk about that as well. Antibody testing. Does antibody testing really confirm an infection? It depends on how you define infection. Some people refer to cats that have aborted infections. They get, it, they get uh, bitten by an infected mosquito, but they abort the infection because of their species and how they deal with the disease process. Some people say, well, those cats were just exposed. I would argue that those cats were infected. They didn't develop an adult infection, but they, had a, they were infected, and the vast majority of those cats will have important symptomatology associated with that, at least residual pathology that we probably need to deal with, uh, and ideally we need to prevent. An echocardiogram. I talked about echocardiography earlier on uh, in, the, in the day, and I really talked about its application. And in the cat, at least, I, I think that echocardiography plays a really important role in definitive diagnosis and in some situations staging disease in the cat. But we get back to that life cycle, and we say, at what stage of the disease is echocardiography helpful? And then, of course, necropsy confirmation. Necropsy confirmation, I'd say, well, that's, that's the best test. That's the definitive test. There's limitations to that as well. We'll talk about that briefly. So how about dye fill test? Dye fill test sounds like a great test, right? Let's look, if we have circulating microfilaria and we can identify them as being dyrofilaria imidis, pretty strong evidence that that cat has an adult heartworm infection. Well, what are the limitations of that? Well, cats usually don't have circulating microfilaria, right? It's suggested that less than 20% of cats that have an adult infection ever develop circulating microfilaria. The vast majority of those cats have transient microfilaria, low volume or low concentration microfilaremia. They don't pose a, uh, or they don't serve as a very good reservoir, and it makes dye fill test a pretty weak test. Okay, it's not a very sensitive test for diagnosing an adult infection. Additionally. Remember, we're looking at the pre-adult infection, and then we're talking about the adult infection. Look, looking for circulating microfilaria isn't going to give you any insight into the pre-adult uh, infection. How about antigen testing? Antigen testing is what we utilize in dogs, right? If somebody were to ask you, how are you going to establish a diagnosis of adult heartworm infection in the dog, everyone would say, I'd do an antigen test. And I use an antigen test as my screening test in all of these dogs. Well, in cats, there's limitations to that. One is cats usually have low worm burdens. And we know the lower the worm burden, the more likely we would have a false negative test. The lower your worm burden, the more likely you are to have a single sex infection. 
If you have a single sex infection with all males, we recognize that none of the antigen tests, no matter how sensitive they are, are going to pick up an infection with only males. So once again, another limitation of that diagnostic test. It's suggested in a naturally occurring infect, infections, probably less than 50% sensitive. So antigen testing, although a positive antigen test, especially in a cat that has symptoms compatible with uh, adult heartworm infection, is pretty compelling evidence that you do, in fact, have an adult infection. A negative test simply means I don't have enough circulating antigen. Question is, could you heat treat that sample? Heat treating that sample in an animal, in a cat that you strongly suspect has an adult infection, may be a very um, reasonable alternative or ancillary diagnostic test that could increase the sensitivity of the antigen test. How about the antibody test? Antibody testing is very effective, in my opinion, in establishing a diagnosis of an early infection, a pre-adult infection. There are studies looking at trickle infections where they gave infective larvae weekly over a period of time, and by four months into those infections, um, all of those cats were antibody positive. Obviously, all of them started out as being antibody negative. So when I look at a cat that I suspect has a pre-adult infection, most of these cats are presented for respiratory difficulty. Some of these cats are diagnosed as having asthma. Um, the first diagnostic test I would run in that cat would be an antibody test because I would anticipate that a cat that's symptomatic associated with a pre-adult infection, heartworm infection, should be antibody positive. Now, do they remain antibody positive when they, be, they develop an adult infection? Um, some studies have suggested the higher the antibody tire, the more likely you are to have an adult infection. Other studies have suggested that, especially when you get um, a single exposure or a single um, infection, not a trickle infection, that the antibody titer actually may trail off over a period of time, and by the time they have an adult infection, that antibody titer actually may be negative. So there are some challenges in evaluating antibody positivity versus uh, antibody negativity in a cat. That being said, if I have a cat that has clinical signs associated with or suspicious of a pre-adult infection with heartworm disease, an antibody test would be the uh, diagnostic test that I'd probably run first. Typically what we'll do is we'll run an antibody test and an antigen test in tandem uh, to try and get a little bit broader evaluation of the serologic status uh, in that cat. Echocardiography, what role does it play? I think that echocardiography plays a really important role in the diagnosis of adult infection. If we have a single sex infection, if we have a single male, I could potentially see that. Antigen might be negative, antibody might be negative at that time. So echocardiography may be the diagnostic test of choice in that. When I have a cat that I suspect has an adult infection, even if his antigen titer is negative, I'll perform an echocardiogram on that patient. It's been suggested that it's 80%, greater than 80% sensitive in patients that have, or uh, feline patients that have adult infections. Sounds great, sounds like a good diagnostic test. Once again, there's limitations. You gotta have the equipment, right? You have to have equipment that is sensitive enough to detect um, the adult worms in situ. One of the things that we look for is the characteristic sign of an adult heartworm. And I don't care if the, the heartworm's in a dog or in a ferret or in a cat. It looks exactly the same. They look like, we refer to it as a hyperechoic equal sign. We see the cuticle on either side, and we see the, the hypoechoic uh, saloma cavity in between, and they're highly echogenic relative to the blood pool and, of course, the saloma cavity. You need somebody with expertise. And just because you bought the machine doesn't mean that you can find these, all right? You need the right transducer, you need to know where to look, you need to know how to get those diagnostic images. And so, to me, finding heartworms in cats is always a little bit of a challenge because cats um, are adept at avoiding complete evaluation no matter what diagnostic test you're applying to them. And you need to be able to get images high at the base. All right, remember 
When we talked about dogs, we said, well, we might not even be able to see the worms. It's not a logical thing to be looking for in most animals. Most dogs, you don't see the worms. Even in some animals that have really important disease, you don't see the worms. In cats, remember that some of these worms can be 10 to 12 inches long. So think about the size of the parasite and the size of the host. There's not a whole lot of places that they can hide. So if you can see the pulmonary arteries, and remember heartworms, you're not necessarily looking in the heart for heartworms. We're looking in the pulmonary arteries for heartworms. So being able to see the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries and looking for the characteristic echocardiographic signature is the diagnostic test, at least in my opinion, uh, of choice uh, for looking for an adult infection in a cat in which you suspect, suspect that. Once again, go back to our life cycle. If I have a cat that I think has a sub-adult infection, so I'm going to look at him with an antibody titer, and I look at him with an echo, an echo's a waste at that time. And now, being able to say clinically this cat has a sub-adult infection or an adult infection is always a little bit challenging. But if this cat has a sub-adult infection, the echocardiogram is always going to be negative. I can't see the sub-adults that are associated with the inflammatory pulmonary disease that we see so frequently. You can utilize that diagnostic test in ferrets as well. Ferrets and cats image in a very similar way. The worms look the same in all species, no matter where they're located, or no matter uh, what chamber they're located in. And they're typically pretty similar size. And finally, necropsy. Necropsy is definitive diagnostic test. You would look at that and say, well, that's, that's the diagnostic test. That's the only way you'd know for certain. Um, and that's true. Um, it doesn't lend itself to serial evaluation. Um, and there are limitations. You think, okay, I'm just going to cut this um, lung open and I'll find the worm. Remember that cats can succumb to an infection with a single worm. And cats actually tolerate adult worms okay. They don't tolerate dead worms at all. And so that cat that had an acute onset of symptomatology may have just had his last worm die, and that worm might have been a little bit decrepit to start with, and that worm will pile up in a distal pulmonary artery, and, and unless you're pretty good at following the pulmonary arteries, I think it'd be a reasonable uh, belief that you could miss an adult infection even on post-mortem. This is not a herd health issue, right? We're not sacrificing a couple of the cats in the cattery to figure out if they have heartworms. This is an individual thing, but I think it's really important if you're in an endemic area and you have a cat that dies suddenly, one of the things that we should probably consider doing in all cats that die suddenly is performing as complete a post-mortem as possible. Because if that cat in that cat household died suddenly from heartworm disease, now we know that all the other cats in that household are probably at risk. They're probably located close to a reservoir and if there's difficulty convincing people to put their animals on, their uh, feline pets on preventative, that might be the bit of information that we need to try and get more and more people on, on preventative. Okay. It's a challenging diagnosis in the cat. When we put all those diagnostic tests together, I think we can get a pretty good idea of whether or not a patient has a sub-adult or an adult infection. Thank you.